So as per the introduction, yes, my name is Andrew wilson Annan. Um, I'm not a native of Australia, as you can probably hear from my accent. You don't need to adjust your hearing, just bear with me. We won't be talking about the cricket. That's not on today's agenda, unfortunately. It's a pleasure to stand before you today and to be able to share my experience and my recovery. I have to say, I don't do this often to a group like this. I have shared my story with individuals as part of my coaching and helping others try and learn from the experience and learn in terms of preparing, but I don't do this often in, a, in this topic in a, in a public space. I'll just start with some, <clears throat> some context, as, as mentioned. Um, we emigrated to Australia in 1999. We lived in Melbourne for a couple of years and we chose to move out of suburbia, having lived in Edinburgh in Scotland in a very urban environment, to move to Wood End. Seven, for those not familiar, 70 kilometres northwest of Melbourne in the Maston Ranges. And within one week of moving up there, I walked down to the fire station. I always dreamt of driving fire trucks. Lights and sirens, five-year-old boy, I'm still a kid, I just haven't grown up. And that's what I chose to do, and it's one of the best decisions I ever made. My wife, Julie, also decides to join up. She's pregnant at, the, at that time with our first child, but she feels that we both should contribute to this community that we're choosing to live in. I was, as uh, mentioned, I was working in Melbourne at the time. I didn't just want to commute. I wanted to be part of the community that I, I worked in. We moved to, uh, we moved to some land. You, you don't own land in, in the UK, if, unless you are very rich. And my, our land has a, a title and all these other things over it. It has a fire overlay on it, on the title. I'm going, what the hell is a fire overlay? And part of the reason for joining the CFA was to understand what is fire, what is management of land, and how do you prepare for these things? I lost the clicker. Mm, good question. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. It's 3.30 on Saturday, 7th of February. Woodend, obviously, at that point, wasn't under any direct impact of the fire, the Kilmore fire. And so a strike team was put together, a strike team, CFA speak, so a car, a four-wheel drive vehicle, or a forward command vehicle, and five fire trucks leave from the Mount Maston group, and we're asked to go over to Whittlesea. As we drive into Whittlesea, we see something like this crazy situation. I don't remember feeling any emotion. It was a job. We did it. We're asked to go to an area just to the north of Whittlesea called Hume Vale. And the road that you can see depicted there is Hume Vale Road. And this is the, the road. This is after the fire. To the north of the road, you'll see a number of houses. And our first task is to protect those houses. The fire's burning on the ridge at the top. A pointer. No. And just as the, the road ends and it, it comes into this curve, there's a bridge. And the sector commander tells us under no circumstances does anyone pass that bridge. No one goes over there. There are houses over there, there are reports of trapped people up there. No one goes over. So we're, we're doing our job, we're, we're protecting these houses. There's ember storm coming down onto these houses. Suddenly a ute passes us and this ute has teenagers in it, and they fly past us. We jump in the car, we stop them, we bring them back. This is my first experience of the connection with people. And when we talk about the emotions of men following um, a disaster, you're also dealing with the emotions of individuals and society, and I'll, I'll touch on some of those later. But they are my memories of the day. Putting water on fire is not a big deal for me. Dealing with the people that I experienced is what lives with me and, and my story. We catch up with the guys in the ute. <clears throat> you see just to the right hand side there's a house right up on the hill. It's, apparently it was called The Block. It was a very well known property in, in Hume Vale overlooking the whole valley. The boy is a 17-year-old named Patrick. His family live there. His mum and dad are up there. His, his brother and his sister are up there, according to him. He runs past us and starts running up the hill. So with my equipment, I follow him. The car stays down in the, in the valley. 
Patrick and I have, have half an hour together. We walk up the hill. He's, he's running. He's on so much adrenaline trying to get up that hill. I talk, I try and keep him with me to try and understand what can I expect when I get up there? What am I going to see? What are the first signs? And he talks about the shedding and the house and etc. We turn the final, call, the final corner and I see a garage. The garage is gone, just the bricks around the bottom and the two cars are there completely burned. I ask Patrick to, to just wait back while I just go and go around the house and explore. He tells me that his father had built a bunker into the ground. He'd put a, uh, submerged a, a container into the ground and we should have a look there as well. I search the property for a half an hour. I go into the container. Inside the container, bottles of wine are stood there completely untouched, pots of paint. Nobody is in the container. Everything is untouched. I have to persuade him to come down with me now from the hill. The main fire has gone through, but there's still trees, etc., burning and falling around us. I try and persuade him to come down, come back with me, report his family as missing people at that stage. We, we can't do any more at this stage. We go back into Whittlesea and uh, we have a quick something to eat about 7.30 and then we're asked to split our strike team up. Three of the tankers are asked to go and uh, attend to the fires in Coombs Road, which some of you will be familiar with. And we're asked to keep two other tankers and escort eight or ten ambulances up to King Lake. The reports out of King Lake are that there's hundreds of critically injured people up there and no one's been able to get through to King Lake and we're asked to, to get up there. Um, we, we, grab a, we grab a dozer as well and we think, oh, well, we'll just put the dozer on the back and it can just kind of follow us up the road. It's 17 kilometres from Whittlesea to King Lake. That 17 kilometres takes us four and a half hours to travel. We turn corners, we have power lines down, we have trees down, we have livestock dead or, or barely alive on the road. We come across a number of those vehicle accidents that were seen on the news the next day. We finally do get into King Lake and that is an experience in itself people coming out of the darkness, tired, emotional, just absolutely knackered, wanting assistance, both medical and otherwise. We do our thing. We, we come back, we, we, leave, um, we leave King Lake at about four in the morning and we get back into Whittlesea. I remember, first of all, getting back on the coach that was taking us back to Wood End. The car that we were in and the two tankers were delayed. The other tankers that had gone off to Coombs Road, they would got back earlier. And as we walked down the aisle of the coach, I remember some of the other firefighters that had been there a while, I was saying, where the hell have you been? We just want to get home. You, you, everyone has different experiences. Everyone's seen different things on that day. But just that is my first trigger that people look at these experiences very differently. I, um, I get back home into Wood End. <clears throat> I have uh, two young daughters. I managed to sneak in the house. They're, they're age four and five at that point. I managed to sneak in the house without waking them. I'm, I'm, I've, I've slept on the coach coming back. I choose to go and sleep in the spare bed. And I've taken my yellow uniform off and I just fall into this bed. I fall asleep instantly. I wake up about two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, I'm in my spare bed. I look around the bed. The sheets are absolutely black. I haven't even thought how dirty I was. And my first thought is, what's my wife going to say? She's going to kill me. I walk into the lounge and my wife stood there watching the Sky News. And it's all the pictures of Marysville and, and others. I know nothing about Marysville. I know what I saw. That's it. She kind of says something like, oh, this is really bad, isn't it? And I kind of go, yeah, it is. Um, she goes, look at all this in Marysville. And I'm going, Marysville, what are you talking about? I've got no idea. She asks me if I'm OK. And in hindsight, that's the first point that I make my first mistake. I say I am. 
I say I'm fine and I don't want to talk about it. And I block her out. I, I'm scared. I want to protect her being a firefighter as well. I don't want her worrying every time I go out on a future fire, thinking where am I, what am I putting at risk, etc. Provider of the household, sole income earner, all of that stuff. This is just a volunteer job that I do. This is something on the side that I do. So I choose not to share that with her. I say though that I've got to go out and I'll go down to the fire station and I bump into a couple of people that have been out with me and we sit and chat for about an hour and I feel really connected with them. We don't really talk but we kind of mumble and talk and I feel really good about that. I come back home and I talk to my boss. So I'm telling all these people around my wife but I'm not telling my wife. I phone my boss. Um, I say to him, there's no way I can come into work tomorrow. I'm sorry, I'm knackered, emotional. He says, well, this is a big week. We, you know, we're just coming out of the GFC. You've got a presentation to do. And we've got a conference on Thursday. And I go, OK, OK, well, I'll go and write that presentation. I go and sit in a room for two hours and do a 10-page you know, presentation. He, it's actually on emerging risks as the topic. He tells me it's the best ever presentation <laughs> I've ever written. I got to work on the Tuesday. Um, really surreal, really weird. Most people are great. Most people are asking how I am. They know I've been there. How, you know, are you okay? Some of the questions earlier were talking about society and how society responds to this. And I don't think this has got anything to do with whether I'm a bloke or a female, but, but maybe they, they had more confidence in, in asking a bloke these questions. But I get a question of how many charcoal bodies did you see? These are people living in Melbourne, watching something on TV like it's a Hollywood movie, and I'm their connection to the fire. I wanted to slap them. I'm not a physical person. I don't hit people, but I so wanted to hit them. I just turn away and walk out. I go home. On the Thursday, we were at the National Conference. I've managed to get somebody else to do my presentation for me, so I'm just sitting there amongst 200 people. And the, the CEO of ANZ finds out that I've been out on the fires. And before the conference opens, he feels he has to acknowledge that, you know, whilst this is a very important conference for ANZ, he can't move past the fact that Victoria has been significantly impacted that week with the, the fires. And he stands up and, and says, look, you may not know, but one of us in the room played a role in it, blah, blah, blah. And he says to me, would you like to come up and say a few words? And I say, no, I can't. I don't know what I'd say. I don't know how I'd hold myself together. So I'm not going to do that. People come up to me after that and say, what the hell are you doing at work, you idiot? You've got skills. You've got, you should be out there on the fire. You shouldn't be here. Again, it's that, that balance in your mind of, Again, this is volunteering. This is a side thing for me that I do. I love doing it, and it's a privilege to do it. But I also have to earn an income for those, for those of you lucky enough to have a mortgage like me, then these things need to be paid for. The CFA offers counselling. And because I work for a big corporate, and I know a number of my colleagues are self-employed, etc., I choose not to take up the, the CFA's offering. ANZ has its own employee assistance program. Um, I'm quite comfortable with the confidentiality of that, and I choose to go with the ANZ one. Um, I meet with someone in Melbourne a couple of months later, and it is just a bizarre conversation. I just don't feel like I can connect with that person. I'm trying to describe the story, describe how I feel. I, I'm not getting anything back. I, I don't understand. I got more out of that hour at the station on that Sunday afternoon than I did with a trained professional. I kind of wonders if I'm at fault here, but that was my experience. In the, in the September of 2009, um, I'm at a lunch with ANZ, and Christine Nixon is speaking. And she talks about what, what should happen, what could happen going forward. She says, we don't need any more money but what we do need is the skills and capability of corporate Australia. So I go up to her afterwards, not something that Andrew does, but I go up to her and say, look, I would like to help. 
And she says, well, why don't you uh, contact Murrindindi Shai? I'm sure they, can, they need some help, and I'm sure you'd be able to assist them. So, okay, so I phoned them, and, uh, and a bizarre phone call where the head of the economic unit says, um, look, our strategic economic development plan effectively has gone. We need another. Do you think you could write one for us? And could you do it in a month? And do you think the bank would second you to do it? And I said, well, look, the bank thing's a no-brainer. That's fine. But I don't think one person can do a good job on this, and I don't think one month is sufficient. But I say, I can't say no to these people. It, I, it's not the way I'm kind of brought up. And I've never done anything like this before. But I choose to go back to them and say, look, I've managed to find some friends at work that can help me, that are willing to support this, that have some skills in facilitation. And over the next 18 months, we work pro bono with the, the King Lake, the um, Marysville, Alexandra, all the communities in uh, Murrindindi to help them build their economic plan. It wasn't something we were doing to them. It was seeking to package what they wanted, the community, the businesses, the local shire, etc. And we come up with an action plan. This feels great for me doing this. And whilst the report that you've received does talk about some of the trauma and some of the behavioural changes in people, from my experience, yes, I had some of that go on. You know, I felt sad, I felt depressed, I didn't share the story, I kept it to myself. But there's been a huge opportunity for me, a real turning point for me, that out of these experiences does come some good. I would never have stood in front of a room like I am here today, talking to you, four years ago before the fires. I would never have stood in front of a community seeking from them what they want from their community and help facilitate that years ago. And that experience has been invaluable to me. It was actually easier doing it in Murrindindi because it wasn't kind of my people, it was another community that I went into and I could jump in the car and drive back. But as I started to do that, I started to think, oh, what if this happens to Wood End? or when it happens to Wood End. What does this mean for my community? I talk as a CFA member that went into somebody else's patch and did a job. What, what bothers me, what scares me, if it was more a local job, and I start to recognize some of those number plates, start to turn up to houses where I know the families, that would be very different, and I think some of that has come out through the report. But my experience, I was like a fly-in, fly-out. I could go in, do a job, and almost like divorce myself and, and come back out from that experience. What that has led me to do is to start thinking about what does it mean for my own community, and start to do some of that preparedness thinking, not just for disaster, but for a whole range of sort of strategic areas from the economy and the built form of Wood End and the social cohesion of Wood End and what does that mean and in doing so starting to have those discussions within the community. So a real turning point and a real opportunity. If I had my time again If, if I had my time again, I'd do exactly the same. I'd just do it quicker. I would talk more, but more importantly, I'd listen more. I'd listen to those that are around me. Because whilst I was only one that attended those fires, there were others. And I think listening is so much more important sometimes than talking. Um, as I said, I, I don't preach to groups. I don't tell what you should or shouldn't do. I think as a, as a volunteer organisation, the CFA has many challenges in regional and rural Victoria. And as the older folk move on and the younger folk come through and those younger people will migrate out of Melbourne and others, and just like me, they haven't been brought up in the country and used to land, etc. There's going to be a sort of another wave of challenges that has to be faced. And how our training in the CFA first and foremost obviously is to be able to control a fire, manage a fire and, and manage people and the, the health of the community. The, the preparation for 
managing emotions in yourself and amongst others and how how you experience incidents. I mean, yes, Black Saturday was extreme, but as extreme in a very much smaller incident can be a motor vehicle accident where there's you know one person injured, etc. They are they are full on um, experiences that um, you know we we do come across. I, th I think out of the report, if if me standing up here and sharing my story today helps somebody else to kind of normalize it a little bit, feel comfortable to go home and share it with one other person, then I think it's a good thing. For me, talking about it, you kind of got a lot of sort of weird stuff going on in your head. For me, talking about it puts the narrative together. It kind of helps you understand. I'd like to do more in this space personally. I'd like to help others. I can relate to some of this. If any of you have bright ideas of what more we can do in this space, I'd be very willing to, to discuss that and hopefully that will come out with some of the groups this afternoon. I do recognise, as, as has been discussed in the report as well, the, the very sort of um, extreme forms of abuse that have been experienced by so many and, and not just obviously the 32 in the report but others as well. The, the alcohol abuse, the, the drug abuse, and the, the physical abuse. They all naturally occur in our society. There is the underlying issue. Disasters and events such as this just accentuate that and bring them more to the fore. I think we have to try and be careful that we're not necessarily just trying to solve this for disasters. Disasters do accentuate those behaviors, but they are underlying, ongoing societal problems. But we shouldn't hide from them. We should talk about them, we should share them. And I think in doing that, you know, we can improve the, this space. And whether it be for men, women, children, everyone of those groups have their own needs in this space. Um, I hope me sharing some of my experience today has been valuable to you. Um, as I say, I don't necessarily represent the 32. Um, it is my story. I, I did have some bad experiences. I do think about it regularly. But I think, as I've tried to show, that there are opportunities as well going forward and uh, everyone has their own journey. So thank you very much.